Hello and welcome to Beyond Reproach. This is Stephanie Domingo. And Tux Lerzal. We come to you from Bushwick, Brooklyn, where we record on land belonging to the Lenape Nation, a nation that is one of many still very much out here doing its thing, and we'd like to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. This is the show, the mini-sode, where we talk about whatever the fuck we want. This is going to be a little bit of a long mini. I, I love it. It takes audacity to call this a mini-sode. Ooh, <laughs> okay. We be drinking and we be swearing. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about the police. Ooh. Uh, in a recent episode, I talked about that time in history when the NYPD, the largest police force in the country rioted in 1992 when New York City's first black mayor suggested holding police officers accountable for their own actions. Like whittle babies. <sighs> Fuck that noise. We can't have that. Accountability? Uh, <laughs> what? In this economy? <laughs> <laughs> during a pandemic? <laughs> Come on. So during that episode, we talked very briefly about the idea that black officers within the NYPD were benefiting from and upholding a white supremacist system. And I feel like most of our listeners probably have at least a vague understanding of what that meant, what we meant by that. But I thought that today would be a good day to kind of give you a little bit of a refresher on the concept of white supremacy of of, of the police being a white supremacist system. Oh, yes. Like all the other systems. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. (laughs) But so I'm going to be talking very briefly today, a very abbreviated history of policing in the United States. Oh, okay. Uh, this is obviously a big topic. Huge. Uh, I definitely the have audacity. Some, some cojones to call yeah. this a mini so today. There's a lot to cover here. I'm going to try to do it as, as condensed as possible to keep it brief-ish. Obviously, I could have done a full episode on this topic, but it's not really it's I'm not really talking about one specific event or a scandal per se. Mm-hmm. So I felt like it fit the mini format better. Yeah. I do, however, hope that eventually we can circle back to like specific events like the City Hall riot that sort of illustrate the point that I'm making in this mm-hmm. in this mini zone. But today I'm going to kind of just be giving like a crash course on the overarching concept of how and why white supremacy is so deeply ingrained in policing in this country. Hold on to your butts. I never really learned anything about the history of policing in school. I would assume that most people didn't. This wasn't something that we were really learning about. But if you did, maybe if you took like an introduction to criminal justice course in college or something, if you were taught anything about the history of policing, you probably learned that centralized municipal police departments started to form in America around the early part of the 19th century, mostly in large northern industrialized cities. The first municipal police department was founded in Boston in 1838, and that idea quickly spread to New York, Chicago, Cincinnati, uh, Philadelphia, Newark, and Baltimore. By the 1880s, all major American cities had municipal police forces. But of course, this is the history of policing that doesn't make anyone feel bad, doesn't make anyone feel uncomfortable. And while it is all technically true, it completely ignores how things went down in southern states. But also, you know, the north as well. I'll get into that. Okay. Because we like to blame the south for like all the problems about race are from the south. And it's like... It is the foundation. The problems are everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Especially in the Pacific Northwest. Like, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the fact that out Oregon was so founded as a white virulent. state. Virulent. Yes. <laughs> Literally, Oregon was founded as a state mm-hmm. that was Ethno free of state. black people. Yep. All non-whites. Yeah. It yeah. was a white state. The Chinese were, were marched oh, out of there of as well. The, yeah, the Mexicans yeah. were marched out of yeah. there. Um, the ones that, were, that weren't lynched. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Policing in slaveholding states started much earlier than it did in the North, but it followed a very different path. In the South, policing evolved directly out of slave patrols in the 17th and 18th centuries and the enforcement of Jim Crow laws in the 19th and 20th centuries. The first slave patrol was founded in the Carolina colony in the early 1700s, but by the end of that century, 
every slave state had slave patrols. Yeah. Uh, the main goal of a slave patrol was to hunt down and capture people who had escaped slavery and return them to their enslavers. But they were also tasked with basically unleashing terror oh, yes. on enslaved people to, in theory, to Not- deter potential uprisings and, and revolts. Yes. In, um, on paper, in theory. It, exactly. Yeah. In theory, like, wink. Yeah. Are you familiar with KRS-One? the rapper yeah 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 and like like that that song he has like this the sound of the police oh yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah he's yeah. like overseer overseer officer yeah. it's like it's 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 a lineage oh yeah 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 i never put that together but yes yeah good times everyone needs to listen to the sound of the police yes. by krs1 and learn some history yes <laughs> so yeah they were you know in theory supposed to be deterring slave revolts um but really slave patrols were A government-sponsored force that was, well, quote, a government-sponsored force that was well-organized and paid to patrol specific areas to prevent crimes and insurrection by slaves against the white community. Yes. On paper. Mm. During Reconstruction, after the end of the Civil War, slave patrols were replaced by militia-style groups Mm. um, that were tasked with controlling these newly freed former enslaved people uh, and enforcing black codes. Black codes were laws that specified how, when, and where freed slaves could work and how much they could be paid. Essentially, black codes maintained a system of slavery without calling it yeah, slavery. It's new. It was the same thing. It's evolution. Uh, with a different word. Yeah. yeah. Uh, black codes also restricted black people's rights to vote, uh, dictated how and where they could travel and where they could live. Mm. Obviously, at this point, this was law enforcement in a way, but they weren't called police at this point. But that's kind of, that's how it evolved into police eventually. Like, this is where it comes from. It's a jobs program for white people. Yeah, exactly. Just our whole police state. Yeah, it's just a fucked up racist form of law enforcement, quote Mm. unquote. So in 1868, the 14th Amendment essentially abolished black codes, but they were quickly replaced with Jim Crow laws which were a form of legalized racial segregation. Separate but equal. Yes. Bullshit. The land of the free, though, (laughs) you know? Freedom and justice for all. You can be free over there in a much worse facility than the facility where we're being free over here. Yes. Uh, So Jim Crow laws prohibited blacks and whites from sharing public spaces like schools and libraries, bathrooms, drinking fountains, pools restaurants, that kind of thing. Obviously, we know this history, Mm -hmm. uh, at least a part of it. But so at this point, since the North now had official government-run law enforcement departments, the South made their Jim Crow law enforcement groups official. They had a name for it, and they were able to set it up through the government rather than just sort of being like, we're going to get together and do this, you know. Mm. The Difference, though, was that the North was setting up their police departments in these, like, large industrialized metropolises, while in the South, they had police in even the tiniest little villages because they needed police to be there to enforce Jim Crow laws. And essentially, they were there specifically to terrorize black people. Yes. Jim Crow laws were in effect until 1965, but just because these laws have technically changed since... That doesn't mean that the culture of dehumanization of black and brown bodies in the eyes of police has changed at all. Yeah. People don't really think about this fact, but like Jim Crow laws were struck down less than 60 years ago. This is like not a long time at all. No. People are still working in law enforcement who were alive when they were enforcing Jim Crow laws. And these are the people who are fighting CRT or yeah, the thought exactly, of it, like exactly. being taught to a child, like a child can even understand that. But totally. Yeah. yeah, but also because they're older people, they're higher up in the organization of police yeah. departments too. So they're the ones making Ugh, decisions on yikes. like systems and how things are structured. Uh, on that note, I think Good it's time times. to take a little break. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to get another <sighs> three drinks. Drink. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> some what a fun juice. one. <laughs> I know. All right. We will <laughs> BRB. Mm-hmm. 
Welcome to Hashtag History. I'm Rachel. And I'm Leah. And if you're a history nerd, or even a history hater, this is the podcast for you. Even if history was your least favorite subject in school, we can guarantee you will like this podcast because we talk about all the things that your history textbooks did not. Things like how the Bonnie Prince Charles and his Jacobite uprising was a bit of a disaster. Yeah, or how the pharaoh Akhenaten was so disliked by Egyptians that they literally purged his name from nearly all of their records and pretended like he had never existed. And we do all of this while drinking and rating a custom-made cocktail specific to that week's topic. So grab a drink, take a seat, and hang out with us each week as we learn all about history's greatest stories of controversy, conspiracy, and corruption. corruption. We are back. We have fresh viskies. <laughs> viskies. <laughs> so before I get any further into the uh, history of policing in the South, I figured let's let's go back up north for a, for a moment. The history that is taught in schools about the creation of northern police forces makes it sound very, very innocent, very yes. innocuous, mm. controversy free. They just needed just some police holding hands, yes. singing kumbaya. We just need some law enforcement up in here, you know? It's the Wild West, New York City. Obviously, that's not not true. So what do you think was going on in the United States in the mid-1800s that necessitated the development of municipal centralized police forces? Um, there were non-white people. <laughs> well, that's also part of it, yes. But there was, there's always been non-white people. I 1800s? Mean, you could it, argue it, that it was just like cities were expanding. Yeah. That there is more Immigration. crime. That's kind of what they were saying is like, the, or at least people now try and go back and say that like, cities were just getting bigger really fast. And, cities and, are always getting bigger really fast. Yeah. Like, what? There is some evidence of like an increase in crime and an increase in vice. But really, if you actually like look at it, most of the time what we would have been talking about is like a slight rise in like public drunkenness or maybe like sex work or something. But like, we're not talking about violent crime. We're not talking about anything that would really necessitate bringing in police to make, you know, to to monitor things. They so, just wanted the streets to be like safe yeah. for fancy folks well, with umbrellas. That's kind of what it's, yeah. So, <laughs> so without a real rise in like dangerous crimes, the real reason? Capitalism. Uh, oh, God damn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. why? Of course. This, Damn it. And we're actually not just talking about pri- uh, protecting private property either. What? Pro- property. Ooh, property. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, what this was about was keeping factory employees in line. <gasps> no. Prior to the mid 1800s, wealthy industrialists were hiring private for profit security companies. Oh, yeah. To maintain order. They were like hiring these people to come in to keep people working. To like watch them, like to be overseers essentially. Exactly. Yes, wow. to be overseers. Wow. Um, but this was this was an expensive way of doing things, and it really only covered the factory grounds. And rich people, wealthy industrialists, they wanted a way uh, to find a way to not only control a trash. disciplined workforce. Oh no! But also to maintain order in the communities where they did business, make sure that nobody's like defacing their property or breaking their windows in their like storefronts and that kind of thing. Not the CVS. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this was much more about social control than it was about crime prevention and crime control. And when they got the idea... I mean, it all to, stems from the same, like, river. Absolutely, yeah, yes. but okay. And when they got the idea to push the costs off onto the government rather than paying for it them, themselves, they were like, heck, yes, yeah. this is a win-win. Yeah. Win, win. Like, we don't have to pay for it. And it covers more than the private guys we're hiring yep. just to do the factory. Fuck yeah. So they used their political influence to push for the development of bureaucratic policing institutions. Oh my God. This is so upsetting. And this was happening at the end of the Industrial Revolution, the tail end of the Industrial Revolution, just before the Gilded Age, the age of the robber baron. 
This is at a time when income inequality is rapidly increasing, like getting so extreme really quickly. I mean, not as extreme as things are right now. Yeah. No. Well, it was worse before. Oh, than was it? it? Oh, okay. Yeah. It was real bad. Okay. People were being exploited through long hours, dangerous working conditions, and low yeah. pay. There are laws against, especially dangerous working conditions and how long you can make somebody work for. You can still make somebody work, but you at least, in theory, have to pay them overtime now. I mean... But, like, you can't just, like, lock the factory doors and... No. Walk away. Light a match into the no. fabric and, no, you know... you can't do that. Yeah. There are laws protecting people, and it's because strikes and labor movements that Absolutely. we have these protections now. Yeah. But at this point, those did not exist. Okay. At a time before unions, the only effective strategy available to exploited workers was then referred to as rioting. But this was a primitive form of the strike, essentially. Mm -hmm. These wealthy industrialists needed to make sure that that was not a viable option. So having a government-sponsored police force mm -hmm. gave the wealthy an organized body of men who was legally authorized uh. to use force to maintain order. And this was also being done under the illusion that this was happening under the rule of law and not at the whim of rich people and the people in power. This is trash. Yeah. This is real trash. I did not know this, but it makes all the sense in the world. So much sense, right? Ugh, yeah. Of course. It's like these businesses, they love they love to like shit on the government. Like once the government has already done all these things for them, like build But the they're the first they ones need. in line when it comes to Absol social pro totally. they, they hate socialism, but they're like I will take government money, please. Yeah. And government, we. I would love to benefit from roads, but not pay taxes. Yeah. I would love to benefit from the police, but not pay taxes. I would love to benefit from like all the R and D that went into making the internet, but then yeah, not pay taxes. Exactly. Using the internet, like because that's socialism. Ugh. If I were to pay for it, but so police were being used almost exclusively as a tool for the rich to target and control the poor immigrants and free blacks police forces were not only being used as essentially publicly funded strike breakers but were of course also you know they were maintaining class superiority yes class supremacy yes but they were also being used as a tool of white supremacy yeah racial hi hierarchy yeah maintaining that 100 percent. that was like i knew about the south and slave patrols but reading on the history of policing and finding out about it wasn't just about race. It was also very much about class, which is yeah, certainly tied to race, too. But yeah, definitely. It's, you know, there's a lot of, there's significant overlap there. Yeah. But, but like, oh, this is about union busting. This and is about preventing. controlling poor people. Yeah. Controlling the working class. Yeah. With, with violent, violent force. Yeah. Brute force, mm -hmm. batons, and this. But I actually, freedom, you guys. Yeah. But freedom. There were so many innovations in policing at this time that were specifically uh -oh. around. I actually took a lot of this out of my outline, but it's still fresh Innovations in, in policing. That doesn't sound uh, good. The, the paddy wagon, the invention of the paddy wagon was basically like they were making larger vehicles to collect more uh, people during strikes They're oh of course during strikes. rioting yeah it was uh, all surrounding labor movements they needed to round up as many people as possible as quickly as possible so they got made these big <laughs> transportable yeah they needed cells to, to essentially. snatch people off the street real quick yeah yeah in mass and batons got longer so that you could like wow and uniforms became a thing police uniforms weren't really a thing before this okay. but the pol the rich people wanted to be able to tell who was a rioter and who was on their side wow okay so let's fast forward to the massive changes that were happening in the 1960s thanks to the civil rights act and the voting rights act Jim Crow laws were finally being overturned in the South. But because these changes were a challenge to white dominance in the South and racist social policies in the North, the police essentially just acted as enforcers of the status quo rather than enforcers of these new laws. Mm. This was not about enforcing laws. No, 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 no. They can You can call them law enforcement, but it has very little to do with no. enforcing laws. Yeah. It's important to note here that most of the well-known civil rights protests where peaceful protesters were met with deadly police violence, such as the march in Selma, Alabama, now known as Bloody Sunday. Yeah. These things happened 
after these new laws were already put into place. Mm -hmm. That didn't have anything to do with enforcing laws. No. This was violent, deadly action at the hands of police to maintain the status quo. And that's basically it. Yeah. And these protests were not just happening in former slave states. They were happening throughout the country. Plenty Mm -hmm. of were happening, happening in the North as well. And in an effort to resist reform and social change, the police would respond with deadly and violent force using dogs, batons, fire hoses, tear gas, Mm -hmm. everything at their disposal. And there's no accountability at all. No, not at all. It's like, wait, what? No, we're we're the law. And sometimes there might be... whatever we do is lawful. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm the law in these parts, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there might be a TV camera there occasionally to catch some of this happening, but it wasn't like today when, you know... Everybody yeah. has phones in their pockets with with video capabilities. But that legacy of violence that this comes out of is still with us today, despite the fact that yeah. everybody has fucking cameras in their pockets. Yeah, cameras don't make a difference. The yeah. system is... I, mean, I guess it's it is showing white attention. people exactly. what we've already the, known. The Caucasian <laughs> awakening is yeah. only happening because there's so much footage. Yeah, I don't think people would, wouldn't be forced to care if they yeah. didn't see it happening. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that's the same in the 60s when the innovation of television showed yeah. like people, nonviolent black people dressed in their Sunday best being attacked by dogs and, and fire hoses. That shook, shook a lot of white people. Yeah. I mean, not not enough, a very small minority. Well, but that's like, the thing is, it was like, the there, first time. There were cameras there, but they weren't showing even a quarter of what was going down. You know oh, what I mean? No. I like, think we are finally seeing more of it today than, yeah. than we used to. Yeah. But it's it's not stopping the police from doing this nope. stuff. And like I said, the protests in the summer of 2020 were also met with violent, brute force at the yeah. hands of the police. And we know that these protests were sparked by the fact that almost 60 years after the civil rights movement, police are still murdering black people yeah. without a second thought. They don't care. Yeah. I mean, there's no reason for them to care because they're not going to be punished. Yeah. Because this is just the system. The system is operating as it was intended to operate. Exactly. Hopefully that will start to change, you know, certain things. The fact that one police officer was... Oh, my God. But it feels like it's like they're sacrificing one officer to be able to shut everybody else up. Yes. Yeah. But still, it's the one officer I was shocked. Yeah. Like, because that's never happened. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe next year it'll be two. It's progress. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, totally. We got to start somewhere. Mm hmm. And, and this has been going on for hundreds of years. I so. mean, but I think people are finally starting to wake up. And I think video has a lot to do with that. Definitely. Yeah. Video and just like young people being yes. like, no, no, no. Yeah. We're not exactly. Doing this. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of people already know this fact, but I thought I. It would be helpful to remind people that black people make up less than 13% of the United States population, but are killed by police at more than twice the rate of white Americans. And the fact that we have an entire social movement based on the idea that black people's lives should have just as much value as everyone else's, that should tell you everything you need to know. Why do you think that this movement exists? It's because... Many people, police especially, don't think that black lives matter. Nope. Police are so upset and offended by the concept that black lives should matter to them that instead they're now trying to reverse the narrative by falsely insisting that their own lives are at risk in the same way. (laughs) This is completely false, complete and utter bullshit. For the record, in 2020, Over 1,000 people were shot and killed by police. Over 1,000. But only 48 officers were fatally shot in the line of duty. And COVID is really running through their ranks. Yes, COVID has killed way more police than any other in the last two years. Yeah. COVID has killed way more officers than any other uh, fatality. Yeah. But only 48 officers in the entire country were shot in the line of duty and killed in the line of duty. Mm. So... In 2020, you were over 20 times more likely to be shot and killed by a police officer than a police officer was to be shot and killed by a civilian. I mean, yeah, that's always been the case. I, yeah. Absolutely. But the yeah. like, bl- but blue lives matter. Blue lives aren't a real thing. It's well, just a thing to shut up black people. Exactly. Exactly. That's the whole point is yeah. to try and reverse the narrative, even though they have no foundation for that. 
I mean, white supremacy is a very deep foundation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So. <laughs> but there's no evidence saying that black that blue lives are at risk in the same way yeah, that black I mean, lives are. Just, they're just mad that exactly. people are hip to what they've been doing for hundreds of years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> at this point in our history, this legacy of racism and white supremacy and policing is still very much alive and well. And the problem doesn't lie solely with racist policies or police leadership or even individual officers. Yeah, no. Private citizens also know that they can use the police as their own personal tool for maintaining white Facts. supremacy for their own benefit. Are you, are you going to the Karen? Who do white women uh, call when they feel threatened by the presence of black bodies? We're talking Karens. The Karen phenomenon. There's such a deep legacy there. It's horrifying as it was with Emmett Till as it is now. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. These because white tears matter. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. way more than black lives. Way more. Yeah, like it's not even close. Yeah, these women call the police because they know that they can use their whiteness as a weapon against people of color. Before their phones even come out of their pockets or their pocketbooks, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are fully aware that the police often mistreat, abuse, or even murder black people all the time. Yeah, every day. For, for almost no reason. And they know they can make up whatever. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're not, there's not going to be any consequences no. for falsely reporting no. a statement to the police. There's there's no consequences for a white woman. Very rarely. Maybe you'll lose your job. Yeah. Well, that's not... That's that has, very recent. It, that's not a consequence that comes from the police, though. That's a social consequence. Oh, yeah, consequence. yeah. You're right. You're right. No, the police aren't going to do there's anything. There's no consequences you're right. from yeah, the, police the police for false reporting. No. Because that's why they're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. <laughs> Even if the police show up in these instances and don't jump to conclusions based on race, if no one is arrested, no one is physically harmed, harm is still being done. Absolutely. In most of the well-known publicly visible cases of Karen's Gone Wild, the black people that are involved never committed a crime. No. There was no reason for Other these women to Other than existing in, in next a, to a white person. In, in what these white women saw as a white space. Yeah. These calls are not about crime. No. They are about limiting the freedom of movement of black Americans, yep. just as police enforcement has mm -hmm. always been. It's like the whole system it's like this unspoken thing that you know white women weren't taught that you know the police can just get rid of black people for you but like everything in the culture has taught them that they have eyes they have eyes yeah, yeah. no that's not something you learn in school but mm -hmm. Look but around. Look, yes. Yeah. But then again, that's the power of but culture. But they also love to feign ignorance when like, oh, well, I didn't know the police could, could be violent. Like, uh, you know what? what I mean? Like, I, it's not my fault. I just... That's hilarious. I just didn't want them using the barbecue pit incorrectly. <laughs> this little child was trying to sell lemonade without a permit. Come on. <laughs> that's against the law. Even if a, an individual police officer isn't a racist or is even perhaps a person of color themselves, it doesn't matter. It is still their job oh, yes. to show up for white callers who Definitely. think that they get to determine who belongs in a space or not. Yeah. White callers expect black people to obey their commands. And when they don't, they summon the police mm -hmm. to assert their superiority over yep. the people they're calling against. Exactly. So I'm not saying that every single individual police officer out there is racist. The problem is... It's a collective. It's just yeah. like men. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Not yeah. all men. Singular, a man can be great. Yes. But like in, in the aggregate. The golden trash bag. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that My man is different. All men are trash, but then you find your golden trash bag <laughs> yeah. and it's magic. Yeah. And yet we wonder why we don't have a lot of men listening to our podcast. <laughs> Enough men do. I'm surprised. That's we true. have like, not true. quite, almost 40%. Yeah, yeah, which is shocking. Yeah. Like, who are you? But yeah, it's it's like as a whole. Absolutely, yeah. yes. This is a systemic problem. That's yes. exactly what that means when people talk about systemic racism. Yeah. The entire structure of policing in this country is built on concepts of white supremacy and class superiority. Yes. And these ideas are so deeply rooted in the system that the damage cannot be undone without major work yeah. to acknowledge, address, and reckon with that history. You know, that's why people want to talk about defunding the police and disbanding the police, because a lot of the functions that the police perform don't need to be done by police officers. Absolutely not. Probably half. Yeah, or 60 to 70% of what the police do could yeah. be done by 
a social worker or a mental health professional. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why people push for that. Mm -hmm. But if we do want to maintain the police... There are some things that we could do. I'm sure that there are plenty of police officers out there who are good, ethical people who want to protect and serve the public. But yeah, at the I think same a lot time, of them do. Yeah, yeah. But it's just the system is so classist and racist that when you're in that system, you can't help but be influenced by and it. And you're doing your job by showing yeah. up and doing the things you're doing. Yeah. But also, like I mentioned earlier, that, you know, there are people that are still alive that are very high up in police, you know, hierarchy mm-hmm. that were alive during the enforcement of Jim Crow laws. Yeah. Oof. So the highest ranking officials in charge of structuring how police departments function benefit from keeping things the way they are and don't want to see anything change. Yeah. There is a little bit of good news. Well, I, when I was researching this, I found this article that was basically comparing different de- police departments. They were specifically talking about Minnesota. And oh, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. But they were saying that there's like two cities that are right next to each other and one is doing all of the worst things and one of them is doing very well. Mm-hmm. And the difference is that the police department that is doing well, when they see accusations or signs of racism within the department, they address it. And they fire people. They uh, it basically just said, like, okay, make like, it known they're that not. they're not going to put up with that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Basically just saying, like, maybe they're not saying keep it to yourself, but at least like, don't be a racist openly out loud. Yeah, exactly. Keep that shit at home. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually does make a difference and, and allows good police officers to do their job better and allows things to move forward and, and change positively. Okay. Maybe it's not a perfect system. It's not. But it's a better system than the other Definitely. police departments who are literally famous on in the media for murdering black people yeah. like at, left and right. And being really really like openly racist. Yeah, exactly. So basically this article is saying when individual departments and their leadership take accusations and signs of racism seriously, do the work to show their officers that it won't be tolerated. No, that's improve. real. Yeah. I didn't know that was happening anywhere. but Yeah. These departments are few and far between. Most departments, though, are the ones where racism is ignored and accepted and it festers and grows. Yeah. Most departments would rather ignore the problem, deny its symptoms, cover up any wrongdoing, and protect their fellow officers instead of protecting the public that they're supposed to be there to protect and serve. Yeah. No, everyone is just trying to keep their job. Exactly. Well, that's that. Uh, and they, the, I can't believe how much NYPD make. Oh my god! Yeah, I was out here thinking that they made like forty grand. Yeah, they're making. I think it starts at like seventy or something. That's. I could be wrong. Outrageous. Don't, yeah, they're they're risking their lives. Maybe they should wear masks. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. You wouldn't have to risk your life if you wore your stupid mask. Yeah. Get a vaccine. And, they're public facing. They should be wearing masks, and yeah, they're not absolutely. in New York. Yeah. So. At the end of that last episode that I I did, I talked about how New York City's new mayor, Eric Adams, used to be a police officer himself. And we were specifically talking about his plan to increase diversity within the department to try and send a message to white officers that open, blatant shows of racism would not be acceptable. Basically, in that episode, I was saying that's not enough, not even close to enough. I mean, that's hilarious. Yeah. That he thought that would be enough. Yeah. But yeah, he's not really trying to move the apple cart so much. It is a step in the right direction. Like I was saying, that police departments where the racist, most uh, openly racist people are shut down and aren't allowed to to move forward and breed that in their department. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. And I think that that's a positive thing. Obviously, it's still not nearly enough, but I do think it is a step in the right direction. Um, But since we recorded that episode, I have since learned that Adams has selected a black woman as New York City's new police commissioner. Keyshawn Sewell will be New York's first ever female police commissioner ever, which like I'm not shocked, but I am. Wow, that's terrible. Yeah. And I think only like the third black police commissioner, maybe. Oh, God. And rather than coming from a rich, privileged background, she grew up in a housing project in Queens, which... I think that that's a positive step. That Yeah, there's class diversity. Exactly. So Adams has also... But I think the 
there's always class diversity within the police because it's sure. like you're not going to do that job unless you but have to any have somebody other option. Uh, the leader of the entire NYPD, yeah, exemplifies racial and class diversity. Yeah, that is a big deal mm-hmm. because usually it is a rich white old totally. white man. Be- but to be, be the cops, first and the only is never a good place to be. No, and because especially you have being to a play woman, the game. As, exactly, you have to be the you have to be a white man. Yeah, you have to play hardball. You have yeah. to be. You yeah. have to be the worst type yeah. of person. Yeah. 100%. But maybe the second black female <laughs> yeah. commissioner from Queens will be great. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah. <laughs> Adams has also insisted that the city will be more proactive in removing abusive officers from the department and that the city will work to speed up disciplinary processes um, to remove officers accused of wrongdoing. It should have required them to all live in the boroughs. 100%. He was like one that of the few, that the few the candidates game who didn't. Because all of these, like, really racist Long Islanders, like... Which he was saying in 1992, he was saying these racist yeah. white men from Long Island. And then when it came time for him to run to mayor, he's like, mm, it's fine. Everybody else wants that, but it's fine. Yeah. Knowing what I know after researching this, I, I am a little bit slightly more hopeful that things can, will change. Okay. But, like... That's good. Oh, yeah. Very cautiously optimistic and, like... I'm not expecting a miracle I at mean, all. I mean, it's the NYPD. Exactly. So. The nation's largest what? police force. Yeah. Things, change is going to come very slowly. Yeah. And, and it's going to be a hard-fought battle. Oh, definitely. Especially definitely. without any real reckoning yeah. of the department's racist history. I mean, that's just the whole country. Like, we can't reckon with it. So it's change is going to be, I'm not going to say impossible, but just really hard. That's why everybody wants to yeah. defund the police because it'd be easier to start fresh. Yeah. And maybe it would be so maybe much we keep some sort of law enforcement department on a smaller scale for certain things. Or if we can get the police department that like the suburbs have. Yeah. That are actually just helpful. It's not militarized. Yeah. yeah. That's, they don't I, have tanks. This is this is another <laughs> like I could have talked about the militarization of the police in this Oof. episode too, but I just That's you a know. big that's a big one. But at any rate, at least you guys now know, without a doubt, yeah. what we were saying when we said that the entire system of policing is rooted in white yeah. supremacy and designed to uphold white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And now you also know that it's also about class supremacy and and class superiority. Yeah. I was trying to find the right word for that. And I I kept writing classism and it was like classism doesn't feel strong enough. It's definitely about class, class supremacy. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. So that's it. That's my, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. (laughs) (laughs) That was a lot. Thank you for that history. It was really illuminating. Yeah. It made a lot of sense. Yeah. Especially the class, the, yeah. and the like labor struggle. Yeah, the labor stuff. Like, wow. It's wild, right? That's how it started yeah. in the North. Yeah. But that makes a lot it of sense. It makes so much sense. Yeah. Because it was in cities where there were a lot of factories and, and yeah, industrialists. Immigrants yeah, exactly. Working um, yeah. and you need to control them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, oh, God. It's mess, but I'm glad to know the history of it because yeah. I feel less insane and crazy. Yeah, right. When yeah. I <laughs> look around, I'm just like, why are we like this? <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, there's. Let me tell you, in the in Beyond Reproach, <laughs> the long episode. <laughs> ah, yes, the long episode. Um, yeah, that was really, really great. But yeah, I guess my drink is kind of. Yeah, I'm we, like halfway. We we've been drinking some yeah. whi- some whiskey. I needed it for mm-hmm. this episode. Mm-hmm. I really did. Thank you so much for listening to Beyond Reproach. This has been Stephanie Domingo and Tux Lurzel over here. Thank you to Tim Clough, our editor, sound engineer, Podfather. We could not do this without him. He's our golden trash bag. <laughs> <laughs> Remember Tuck said that, not me. (laughs) (laughs) Tim, edit that out. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Beyond Approach is proudly recorded in Bushwick, Brooklyn, on land belonging to the Lenape Nation. Please note we are not historians. We are just a couple of drunks who never shut up and love history. Full list of all source information can be found in the show notes on our website. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. Written reviews are especially important. If you like us, please do one of two things. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or send this episode to a friend, family member, or someone who you think would be into it.
Make sure you follow us on Instagram because we post our cocktail recipes the Thursday before each full episode. Please drink along with us if you are not driving. We also have a shop on beyondreproachpod.com. Get your merch, brand yourselves. We have exclusive content on Patreon where you can directly support the production of our show.